it's really interesting. I actually started working in school food um, and one, in 2010 when the first, uh, or my first experience with CNR um, was being advocated for. So it was really interesting to say how quickly time passes. Um, but I think what we really learned is that if you make a plate of beautiful, healthy vegetables and put it in front of a child, that child may not eat it. Um, you know, it's not how we do it at home, so it's not how we can really do it in schools. Um, and it's really important for us to think through how we engage students and parents in the process. So the way BFC works on our school food program is really educating and empowering parents to make changes. Um, when we think about all the different people who are involved in school food, um, you know, you have the Office of School Food, you have students, you have parents, you have teachers, um, and we find that parents really um, are the strongest advocates because it, it's their children and they really want them to eat healthy food. Um, and so with the changes that came uh, with the CNR in the last round um, and the nutritional requirements that um, Jan was touching on, we saw that students you know, stopped eating. They couldn't really connect with the food. You know, we saw a drop across the country and a drop in New York City. Um, and it really pushes us to really think about not just increasing access, but what does really increasing access to it, what really makes a child pick something off a plate and eat it. Um, and that's really about engagement. I come from a school gardening background, um, and I've seen students you know, go from seeing sprouts on the plate and daring each other to eat it um, because they don't know what it is, to pulling purple carrots out of the ground. Um, and uh, really, it's a transformative experience. It creates a sense of fascination and wonder around food. Um, and uh, it's something that we, we really want to focus on creating those experiences so students can connect with what's in the cafeteria. Um, as you were speaking, both of you, um, I kind of just like, oh, I feel like we just all like, got together and wrote this together. Um, <laughs> because when those changes happened around the nutritional requirements, we lost that flexibility, and that's really how we engage parents. Being able to go to a meeting, learn about how school food worked, talk to other parents, and you know, really find some common ground around what you want to see on the plate, and seeing that change uh, you know, in a month or two is really powerful. It's a really powerful moment for a parent to say, I made this change. And also, it's a really great moment for parents who are coming from different backgrounds, um, whether that be race, class, um, culture, they were able to find this middle ground. So it really was an opportunity for parents to come together in a school um, and work together while now it can be a little bit decisive, uh, divisive because there are just these three menus they can choose from. Um, and so what we've seen is we've really just turned to what other opportunities parents have to see a quick change while also doing that longer advocacy work. And so as you were talking, I was just like, salad bars. Um, and so last week, um, we had a school food network meeting, which we do three to five times a year around a specific issue to bring together parents and students and teachers and staff um, and people who work on school food and people who just who've eaten school food. Um, uh, it's really open to everyone. And we did it on salad bars because that's why I've been hearing a lot about. Um, salad bars look very different in different schools. Um, in some ways, where we see kind of an inequality between some of the schools we work with because we focus on schools that are in low-income areas or serve students coming from a, a low-income family. And uh, I always like to, to think about um, how school food works. A lot of times people get bogged down in the details and all the restrictions. So I opened up with uh, sharing a blank salad bar um, on the sheet of paper, just a couple rectangles, nothing too fancy. Um, and I asked everyone to draw or write what they want to see in the salad bar. What are the things that you would like to see? Um, and it was amazing. You know, you had things that are in salad bars now, you know, tomatoes, cucumbers, lettuce. But then people you know, were talking about quinoa, and people were talking about kale, and butter lettuce, and olives. Um, and then, unfortunately, we had to go into that process where you go, why can't you see the quinoa in the salad bar? Why can't you see uh, grilled chicken? Um, but also knowing that if you push hard enough, you can get it. We've seen parents do this across, across the city. Um, and so it was a really great thing. I think, you know, because it's considered an add-on, it does have that flexibility. But in my mind, as I was thinking about, what does this mean? How do you connect this to policy? 
I thought, you know, what, wouldn't it be great if there were funding for salad bars? Um, because, because it is an add-on, you have to find the money other places. And school food managers are really good at kind of doing the magic um, of moving cents here and there. But um, it becomes tricky. So if we really want to see salad bars be uh, vibrant and, you know, bring back that choice that's now missing because of the new regulations and the lockdown on the menus, um, you know, to really do that, it does require some funding. So that was one of the things I, I dreamed up. And we have great programs like Garden to Cafe and the National Farm to School Network, um, which is great. Um, and we've seen kind of funding increase for that, but I think we want to kind of keep pushing um, to see it increase more because we found models that work. You know, kids growing food, kids learning about food, kids cooking food, and really understanding um, what's, on, what's on the line or on the salad bar really encourage them to take it. Um, and I think that, um, I guess what I would kind of end on is, you know, some of the meetings I've had over the last few weeks with school, uh, with school staff and parents, and we were talking about wellness policies, one of our schools, um, one of our parent fellows, who's a parent who does like intensive training around community organizing and school food and policy advocacy and gets stipended for their, the work that they do um, because it's so important. Um, we did a cafeteria observation. We just kind of sat down in the back of the cafeteria in elementary school in bed and then watched the kids go through and really you know, saw all of the, the elements that we forget about. You know, we, you saw um, the school aide, you know, trying to count people while, you know, kids were waiting by the water jet to try to get water, but the cups weren't there. And, um, you know, we saw the piles and piles of uh, junk food bags just like underneath the, the table. Um, and they decided they want to do a, a healthy snack policy and kind of eliminate junk food, but they didn't have, you know, the time to really implement it correctly. So we were talking about starting a wellness council and, you know, it's Friday at like 1 p.m. So the principal is just kind of like sitting there, you know, nodding and <laughs> talking about how like, she really wants this in her school. And she even brought up a really good um, element around what wellness means in her school, not just access to food um, and healthy food and fitness, but also <coughs> um, emotional and mental health of students as well, which is a really uh, uh, great component that sometimes is missing from wellness policies when we talk about it. But she just said, you know, we we love this and we want to do this and I want to offer this to my children, you know, as she had two students standing in the back there who've been like fighting and she was just like <laughs> watching them. Um, and she was like, mental, mental health. Um, <laughs> um, but, you know, it came down to money um, because it, these things take time and these trainings um, take time and, and money to kind of really implement it. So I really want to see in this next round of CNR people kind of uh, lifting up these examples and continuing to move in this direction and also revisiting some of the wins that were happened, you know, with Lunch for Learning, which Jan touched on, which I'm very excited about, you know, talking about how we collect information and really, you know, not just dreaming up um, new things, but really strengthening what's already there. Um, and so I think, I think I'll end there. Um, can I add that the Wellness Council is a non-funded mandate? Yeah. <laughs>